Today, I have with me Dr. Daniel Lapsley. He is a professor of psychology at Notre Dame University, where he directs the Moral and Adolescent Psychology Lab, studying adolescent development and moral development. Dan, it's good to have you here. Welcome Thank to Race Cargotons. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. Here. Glad to have you here. So the first thing I thought when, when reading about your work is, you know, morality, that's, that's a philosopher's job. What's a, what's a psychologist doing? How do you measure something like that using uh, experiments? Yeah, so it's a good question. You know, uh, historically, of course, we have been wondering about, about morality since antiquity, you know, so it's a mm -hmm. long topic of which has been robust philosophical uh, reflection. And you know, the, the interest in moral psychology as, a, as, a, as an empirical discipline, and I, I should say, Moral psychology, that term is also used by philosophers. Uh, but, the, but the empirical wing of moral psychology sort of mirrors the history of psychology generally. You know, there was uh, almost all topics in cognitive psychology were addressed by philosophers. And at some point, I want to say in the mid to late 19th century, it became clear that uh, some of the topics can be uh, amenable to empirical investigation. Uh, and so we no longer rely on philosophy of perception, for example, or memory or cognition. We do empirical studies to do that. And I think, uh, I think the various psychological paradigms that emerged in, in the early 20th century began to orient towards uh, issues of fairness and uh, character and moral behavior also using empirical methods. Now, now, the way this has been investigated over the 20th century and into the 21st has changed, you know, so... I think at some point, uh, people were interested in, say, behavioral environmentalist approaches to understanding why kids come to behave uh, in a moral way, you know, so you know, there are behavioral approaches, reinforcement, contingency approaches, punishment, obedience approaches. Uh, and then as paradigms change, you know, we begin to investigate with the cognitive revolution, uh, the idea that how we think about morality is also amenable to all the models that we use to understand reasoning. Uh, and I, I think the, the big change, at least from my background, is uh, when I was coming of age as an academic, I got my PhD in 1982 uh, at UW-Madison, but in, in those days, the Piagetian paradigm, the cognitive revolution in, gen in psychology generally, but in developmental psychology in particular, uh, was pretty much wrapped up with... Uh, uh, with the cognitive developmental approach uh, of Piaget, and or I, I, uh, at least the way that we, the way that has come down in, um, to my end is, is, is in Larry Kohlberg's work on moral stage theory, and, and so that's all about using judgment, decision making, rationality to understand how we understand complex moral issues, moral dilemmas, and so the way the Piagetians and the Kohlbergians and that moral stage theory team investigated. You asked, you asked about how do you do experiments with that? Well, they didn't do experiments. Uh, I mean, that, that paradigm didn't do experiments. They simply interviewed people and wanted to know how they thought about hard case moral dilemmas. Right, so it, it was more observational back in the day. Yeah, so, the interview. You know, they, so it, it came from a structural tradition. The, the, the basic understanding was that the, the way we thought is structured by our intelligence. By, so there's a cognitive structure involved uh, and that we bring these frameworks to bear when we look at the moral landscape, you know, so what we, what we see depends on who we are, you know, what we see depends on our, in our, in our stage of thinking. And so the best way to understand how one's thinking is organized, how it's structured, and then how it changes is to actually talk to them and get some clues about how things are structured on the basis of a complex uh, oral interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm still thinking about the distinction between, between moral psychology and moral philosophy, let's say. And one of the things that's popping into my mind is the idea of an ought versus an is. And it seems like moral philosophers are often concerned with how one ought to behave. And psychologists, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, we're looking more at how we do behave and not necessarily prescribing any oughts. Yeah, this is a very, uh... This is a very important tension in the field. I, I, I guess the is ought distinction has a couple sources in Hume and uh, maybe uh, G.E. Moore writes about the naturalistic fallacy and all that. Uh, so, you know, let, let me say that 
uh, I think philosophers will insist on, many philosophers will insist on that distinction between is and ought and, and divide up the division of labor between psychologists uh, and philosophers along that wall, along that line. But I have to say also that um, there are a lot of philosophers that, that think that wall is bridgeable, that the link between is and ought is not a formidable one. I remember reading an, an, art, an article by Alistair McIntyre many years ago, when, when it, back in 1950, late 1950s, where he basically argued, if you look at Hume's writings, people interpret what Hume is saying as, as um, somehow putting up a wall between is and ought. But he said his book uh, is really an example of how to, how to commit that fallacy, how, how to bridge it, you know. So I, I, don't, I, I don't think this is, uh, uh, an impenetrable wall. I don't. Th I think in order to understand how, uh, I, I think to understand what one ought to do in certain situations, you have to understand complex aspects of human psychology and behavior. Um, mm -hmm. ought, ought implies can. <laughs> so if, unless we understand how we can do things and what things are within our grasp, and uh, otherwise, I think our reflections on what is ought to be the case to be uh, metaphysical reflection. You know, I read a paper recently uh, where I used the metaphor of the mending wall. And the mending wall is the title of a famous uh, William J. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Robert Frost poem called Mending Wall. And in it, there's a, a very famous expression, which I think is misinterpreted. The expression is uh, good walls, good walls make good neighbors. And, and I, I think that has been misinterpreted because when you actually read the poem, what it says is that at spring mending time, people come together to repair the wall uh, at spring mending time. And, and, and you're, you're re re rebuilding the wall. You pass boulders from one side to the other. And, and the poet goes on to say that there's really no need to rebuild the wall because what grows on one side doesn't affect what grows on the other. You know, So I think what the message of the mending wall is concerned is that, the, is that it good walls make good neighbors because it, it provides an opportunity for good neighbors to come together to collaborate, to, 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 hold, to build the wall together in collaboration. And, and I think that's a very powerful metaphor for the link between empirical moral psychology and philosophical moral psychology. We are trying to repair the mending wall and what it means to be a moral person from both disciplines. We both have to respect each other's autonomy. Uh, philosophers and psychologists have different jobs to do. Uh, but at spring mending time, there are occasions to come together to rebuild the wall and see and see where we can collaborate, if at all. And sometimes there's going to be tension about what is an empirical problem and what is a philosophical problem. But I don't think um, raising the flag of is odd is going to be all that helpful in the end. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that stops the conversation. Uh, and, uh, and if we're going to make any, if we're going to make forward progress in our work. Uh, then we, get, we need to find a language to, to collaborate with each other. And in fact, I see a lot of that around town. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of interdisciplinary work across the mending wall of moral mm -hmm. psychology. Yeah, this mending wall idea might be a great place to tie things back to Piaget. So he yeah. studied uh, play in children, and it yeah. seemed that play was a, a crucial point of development in terms of learning how to behave socially and behave within a set of boundaries within this, this wall, I mm -hmm. guess. And one of the first forms of moral conception, at least within Piaget's framework, if I'm remembering correctly, is first you start with just following rules. You don't necessarily create any abstract moral codes. It's just like, here's the rules, they're written down, mm -hmm. and then you break it, you're acting immorally. And then only later you begin to create these, these kind of more abstract notions of good and evil. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that is well, that was Piaget's view. He he understood. Uh, you know, you can think of Piaget's theory as an argument with Emil Durkheim. Uh, Emil Durkheim, um, you know, basically had the idea that that one way we that moral formation happens is we get the younger generation to submit to the rules and and obligations of the older generation. Um, and Piaget thought, didn't think that was quite right. He thought that what Durkheim was describing was really what he described as the first stage of heteronomy where, where we believe that the, the, what adults say is the, is the, is the moral rule. Uh, adults are infallible in that way and that our job is to obey the rules. 
uh, and so on. And, and Piaget thought that was a pretty shabby morality, to be honest. And, and he thought that was the only characteristic of young children. A and, and he thought that the, the heterotomous orientation, the, the obedience orientation that he thought was more characteristic of young children, he, he thought that came out of a particular kind of relationship. And that was the one where the adults had more power and they were opaque and children did not understand their rules. They, they thought that children understood parental injunctions as a request for blind obedience, in Piaget's view. And so the nature, the unequal nature of the relationship between a parent who is all powerful and child who had none was really the relational ground of this heteronymous respect for rules. But when children begin to interact in peers, in, in, the, peer, or in the peer society, uh, it's more a society of equals. And, and so children in that, in that society, they have to win over their friends with reasons. You have to have good reasons. And, and, you, and there's, there's a better sense that the benefits and burdens of cooperation have to be balanced. And he thought that led to a change in moral orientation as well, which he called the morality mm -hmm. of cooperation, uh, which was superior. And so the key thing for Piaget is that our moral sensibilities is derived from the kinds of relationships that we have. Um, so he talks about two broad stages of moral judgment, right? He also writes mm -hmm. about a third stage. Uh, it didn't, doesn't get as much ink, but the third stage is a stage of equity, which arises more in adolescence. And, and, and equity is a correction on justice, because sometimes treating everybody the same is not fair. Mm -hmm. And what and what equity does is correct for that and make certain allowances for uh, unequal starting places, for example. Right. So I'd like to ask how much how much of this still rings true, or at least it affects your work, and how much of it has kind of branched off from from these starting positions. Yeah. So that's a good question, and I would say when I was coming of age as an academic, I was already. Uh, orienting to Piaget when the rest of the field was orienting away from Piaget. So I felt like I was mm -hmm. ca catching up to him in a way. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that you, you could probably find broad changes in children's thinking along Piagetian lines. Uh, so he has identified some very interesting phenomena that researchers have followed up on. Uh, for example, the topic of distributive justice or children's understanding of fair sharing, their understanding of fair punishment. Uh, people have followed up on a lot of these, a lot of these topics. Uh, where Piaget has ended is really where Kohlberg, Larry Kohlberg's work and his team at Harvard began. Mm -hmm. I'll just say a word about that and I'll come, sure. come around to where I think the field is today. You know, the Kohlberg team uh, was very influenced by Piaget. It's a very Piagetian cognitive developmental stage. Uh, Piaget, I'm sorry, Kohlberg's work began with his dissertation in the late 1950s. And a story I like to tell about Kohlberg is that I, I, there's something about his biography that's very interesting and telling. And that is when he was a, when he was a late adolescent, he, he joined the Merchant Marines to uh, engage in, a, in the World War II. He, he was involved in the Merchant Marine, he enlisted, and his ship was involved in convoying supplies to Europe. And then after the war, he stayed in Europe and got involved with, with, with smug, smuggling Jews to Palestine, uh, which at the time was against Allied policy, British policy. The, the Royal Navy basically had a blockade of Palestine to prevent the wholesale um, evacuation or immigration of European Jews to, uh, to Palestine. And, and so, but Culver got involved in that. His boat was stopped by the Royal Navy and he was imprisoned with a bunch of others on Cyprus uh, and where he stayed for about six months. And, th and then the Jewish Haganah, the Jewish Defense Force, which was agitating for, for a Jewish state, sprung them. You know, they went and you know, sprung them and took them back to a kibbutz in Palestine, in Israel, and where he stayed, stayed another six months. And I kind of lose track of his story after that, but he makes his way back to the United States and he, and he ends up in a clinical psychology program at the University of Chicago. And, I, and, it's, and I'm told that um, he began to be interested in where is it in modern academic psychology where we can reach or justify or provide empirical grounding to support uh, uh, an ethical universalism. You know, he, thought that, he thought that behaviorism and psychoanalysis, which, which was at the time the dominant paradigms 
he thought those two paradigms actually encouraged ethical relativism. It was kind of shocking to him because we would have nothing to say as academic psychologists to justify why we fought against Nazi morality. You know, on, on what basis do we think Jim Crow morality is, is wrong in Southern US or, or the apartheid morality of South Africa? You know, so, so all he saw was ethical relativists in modern psychology. And he was, he said, well, what is it? Is, is there nothing to be said academically, research-wise about to justify a universal perspective on morality? Then he discovers Piaget. Mm -hmm. And then what he discovers, what he learns from Piaget is that uh, we can make normative claims on a basis of cognitive developmental research. You know, so, so Kohlberg famously writes an article uh, in the 1960s called From Is to Ought, How to Commit the Naturalistic Fallacy and Get Away with It in the Study of Cognitive Development. And his basic argument is, if you think of Kohlberg's six stages of moral reasoning, you can think of each stage as a kind of moral theory. And on good moral and, and cognitive grounds, you can say that the higher stage is better than a lower stage. Stage three is better than stage two on good co cognitive and moral grounds. Three is better than two, four is better than three, and so on. And, and the basic claim he makes, which is quite interesting, is that uh, later stages are better than uh, uh, earlier stages if it's the product of development. And so on that basis, Kohlberg saw his project as a way of defeating ethical relativism. We defeat ethical relativism if we can get kids and individuals to reason at the highest stages. At the mm -hmm. highest stages, you understand that morality isn't relative. Right. You know, and for our listeners, we should list out these stages if, if you have them all, in, or if, <laughs> okay. if, if, if you don't have I them can, memorized. No, no, then... no, 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 I have them memorized. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, so the six stages, so there are three levels. So the pre-conventional level, the conventional level, and the post-conventional level. And there's two stages at each level. So the, at the pre-conventional level, he didn't really have much to say about stage one other than it's a stage of cognitive egocentrism where it's, kind of, it's like Piaget's first stage of heteronomy. Uh, at stage two, he called stage two a concrete individualistic stage. Uh, at stage two, you have an understanding that other people have their wants and needs and you have yours. In order to get what you want, you have to strike deals. You know, it's like you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, eye for an eye, teeth for a tooth, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And he called it a concrete individualistic perspective. You have your concrete needs and you try to meet them. You try to meet other people halfway to get your needs met. And he used a very uh, jargony term to describe the moral reasoning at this stage. He called it the stage of instrumental hedonism. Uh, basically, it's using people as a means to an end, using people as an instrument to get what brings you happiness. You know, so that's pre-conventional. The conventional level starts as stages three and four. And, and at, at, at these conventional levels, you begin to take into account the needs and considerations of other people for their own sake. You know, so at stage three, you are concerned to, uh, to maintain your social relationships with people you know, uh, your family and friends. And one of, one of the ways I like to describe stage three or Kohlberg describes stage three is, it's the stage, what, what you consider moral, uh, morally significant at stage three is what is required of being a good role occupant. You know, so being a good, being a good husband and a loyal son and a loving spouse, you know, you, know you, do, you do what is required of the role that you occupy and that seems to drive morality. Uh, but of course, we don't always interact with just a society of friends and family. We also live in a broader society of citizen strangers. And that's when stage four comes into play. Uh, stage four, um, we regulate our behavior with stage four uh, with, with laws. So what is legal is considered to be of primary importance. Uh, then we move to the post-conventional stages of stage five and six, uh, where we begin to judge our legal arrangements in terms of moral abstract moral principles and those that have universal intent. Uh, he, he once wrote that stage six considerations, you're explicitly driven by abstract principles like Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. Um, so as it turns out, there isn't anybody at stage six. There, the, the team has never identified anyone at that stage, with the possible exception of Kohlberg. Um, 
Uh, so, so, that, so no one scores for stage six anymore and stage five is vanishingly rare. Most of us get by on conventional reasoning in some ways. But you do see some of this at play, you know, when with the second Iraq war, for example, you know, there were a lot of people against the war, but you know, there are also people who thought that was awfully unpatriotic of you to not support the war. It was, you know, so sometimes, um, sometimes support being patriotic and supporting your country uh, uh, is some, some ways of doing that is actually to be, to be critical of the arrangements that, that your society has made. At state, at the post-conventional level, you're more likely to ask, is it moral as well as is it legal? But at stage four, is it legal kind of seals the deal, kind mm -hmm. of ends the argument. So, right. But I just want to say, Adam, that you, you asked about the relationship between philosophy and psych critical psychology. Well, mm -hmm. this is one way, I mean, Kohl, the Kohlberg team really uh, took philosophical understanding of constructs as the starting point. So he's basically describing upper stages in terms of Kantian morality but, uh, and uh, the universal claims that morality makes. And, and, and at that stage five and six, you begin to sound a lot like Immanuel Kant and embracing the categorical imperative as a way of justifying your moral decisions and your moral behavior. So in the Kohlberg paradigm, there was a very explicit attention the philosophical conceptions of morality. And in, and in some ways, um, you know, it, it's an attempt to make empirical uh, what Kant was describing as moral rationality. Mm -hmm. And especially as your work focuses on adolescent development, as you're moving up these stages, um, what's, what's the motivation for it? Is, is it supposed to be just a natural process or is it like as you behave, um, more morally, maybe you get social standing or people like you more, you get certain benefits that, that bring yeah. you there. Uh, yeah, a couple of things to say there. Actually, the, 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 the higher up the, the higher up you go, the less likely you are to make friends. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, well, Kohlberg, Kohlberg, Kohlberg has written about this, you know, the, the, our models of moral exemplars at the highest stages are people uh, who annoy the general society, you know, it's Jesus, it's Martin Luther King, you know, these people tend to get assassinated, you know, they're mm -hmm. controversial because they're, they're, they're providing a moral critique of the conventions of one society and, and nobody likes that, you know, so, right. so you don't often make, make friends as you go up the line and, and, and sometimes taking a principled level perspective on a moral issue puts you at odds with your own family. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so you don't necessarily move up the line. Although there is a social dimension to it as well, you know, Col the Kohlberg team would say that one of the things that motivates cognitive development or so moral development is the experience of cognitive conflict, uh, uh, being encountering points of view contrary to your own, especially framed one stage above your own. And so having active conversation and discussion about dilemmas and, di and dialogue is the thing that motivates you. And it's a very Piagetian mechanism. The mechanism is the experience of cognitive disequilibrium. It's the, the experience of cognitive conflict and not, not being able to make sense of the world with the intellectual structure you bring to it. And so when you encounter contrary points of view, it forces you to, re, to recalibrate and the general Piagetian stage idea is that we recalibrate at the next highest level. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's the thing. There aren't very many moral stage theorists these days. You know, so in fact, the Kohlberg regime, the Kohlberg paradigm was awfully important for a very long time, two or three decades, really, from the, well, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, beginning 80s and 90s, I think uh, it became more creaky. There, you know, it was very hard. It became very hard to document empirically two important claims that the Kohlberg team made or Larry Kohlberg made, and that is what he called the structured whole assumption. Uh, the structured whole assumption is that when you, when you reason from a particular stage level, that cognitive structure that organizes your thinking at that stage really pulls together almost everything. You know? So it, you, you reason at that stage level across many kinds of dilemmas and kinds of moral issues. Well, that became hard to show. Sometimes people reason differently on hypothetical dilemmas than they reasoned in real life dilemmas, for example, or different different dilemmas of different areas of life, you know. So it became very hard to show that one reason consistently. So mm -hmm. the structured whole assumption, you know, was having a hard go of it. And then the other important assumption was the invariant sequence assumption. The, the assumption being that, that we move, 
up the stages in a regular consistent order. We don't go back, there's no regression. If you reason at stage four, you don't decide the reason at stage three on some other dilemma. You know, but, it, but in fact, his own data began to show that there's a lot of variability in the sequencing of the stages as well. P uh, Kohlberg once wrote that those two assumptions are the glue that holds together his theory, the structured whole assumption and invariant sequence. Both of those became unavailing. Uh, the research didn't seem, seem to support that. And my impression is, I have a lot of friends in the Kohlberg team, so they, they know I would say this. Um, my impression is, is that as the research paradigm unfolded over decades, uh, it began to be reactive and reactionary and defensive, trying to patch up the boat when the boat was sinking because of the empirical record. And so it, it became narrower and narrower and narrower and turned in on itself. So that it became relatively uninteresting anymore. Uh, and so, so, that, so then people, I think, began to look around. You know, what, is, what, what are we missing by focusing on moral judgment and its development? Okay. Well, it turns out we're missing a lot. We're missing, for example, issues of moral personality. We, we, we haven't talked in the, the, under the authority of the Kohlberg regime. Uh, there was very little talk about virtues, very little talk about moral selfhood, moral personality. Uh, and why is that? Well, because the Kohlberg team, Larry didn't think that focusing on virtues could help him solve the moral relativism problem. Because uh, that, that was the main thing driving his work. How can we provide the intellectual resources to defeat ethical relativism? Uh, well, if you want to focus on virtues, that's not going to help that cause because different communities will prioritize different kinds of virtues. Right. You know? And he derisively called that the bag of virtues a problem. When he, when he looked at the landscape of moral education at different schools, you know, this school, will, you know, this school will value these six traits and these people, those five traits, and everybody had their own bag of virtues. And, and it just seemed helpless to do what he wanted his theory to do which is to defeat ethical relativism. Not criticizing Kohlberg for that. We all have to make choices in what we study. And that's what he wanted to study. And the enormously productive and interesting field expanding research, we still teach it today. Uh, I still teach it today. Uh, but, but moral stage theory does not drive, the is not the engine that drives uh, moral psychology and moral development these days. It's mostly, I, I don't want to say it's entirely for historical reasons, but uh, um, but it basically is. It's very difficult to, you, you look around town, you don't see very many moral stage theories anymore. Uh -huh. So the big two in, in the modern era then are moral personality and moral virtues? Yeah, I kind of think they're about the same paradigm, you know. Um, so I think there's been a, I, I think there's more energy around issues of personality and virtues. Uh, so virtues are basically the dispositional things that that are like traits, I guess, or like personality to disposition. So I, I would use moral personality as a broader term. Uh, mm -hmm. Another term that I think is, is, is used as a synonym is character. Uh, so you see a lot of interest in, in character development. or you, there, There's more uh, interest in using or people are more comfortable using a language of character than they used to be. I'll tell you a little thing, a little story. Like back in the 80s, 1980s, uh, whether you were a moral development person, whether you said you studied moral development or whether you studied character development said a lot about you. You know, mm -hmm. they, they're like two different paradigms, two different ideological perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you said you were a moral development, you were probably a political liberal. You probably read Dewey. You liked Piaget. Uh, you know, <laughs> but if you were a character development, you were more conservative. You're, 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 you 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 want to recover certain uh, certain dispositions that were more common in the earlier part of the 20th century, you know. So you could almost tell how people voted depending on how they described themselves. And moreover, there are two different professional societies. You know, so if you were kind of a developmental Kohlberg team, you, you joined the Association for Moral Education. If you were a character development, you joined some other organization. Uh, you, there are different journals, you know, that publish one or the other. So the word character and the word moral were really um, signals for other ideological things you believed. That's how different things were. You know? huh. So how um, did this come to converge then? Well, I think uh, 
Yeah, I think here's the thing. I think uh, that I want to say the collapse of stage theory generally, and I'm including Piaget too. You don't see very many ardent Piagetians these days either. Uh, so I think it's the collapse of stage theories in the moral domain uh, opened up a desire to look around town and see what have we what have we been missing and what can we recover. Um, that's my take on it. I've written about you know kind of the history of this and and I think there was a time when I used to, I did an article with my wife Josh and I once um, where we talked about how moral development or moral psychology empirical moral moral psychology was at a crossroads. Here we had the diminution of um, paradigm developmental stage theory that has served as a guidepost for a long time, but now widespread dissatisfaction with that. Now, now what? Now what do we do? So I think what, what happens, I, I think the rhythm of science is such that we try to look for the most comprehensive, most integrative theory. I just think that's in the DNA of science. Mm -hmm. I can put it that way. If, DNA, if science has a DNA, I think it's, uh, I, I, think, I think we, we try to find the most general, most powerful, most comprehensive theory. And so when moral stage theory is collapsing, I think we look around to see, well, what can we learn from other domains of psychology uh, and other philosophical domains too, for that matter. And so for my money, where I sit, other people listening to this might come to different conclusions, but where I sit, what, what I found meaningful was, was research in personality psychology mm -hmm. uh, and developmental, developmental psychology and personality psychology didn't, didn't often converge either for, for interesting reasons, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, but increasingly they have, you know, so I, I think, now I'm a developmental psychologist. I think no explanation is entirely complete unless you tell a developmental story and how you got there. <laughs> so I, I'm basically friendly to developmental theories, but I look at, I look at the advances in personality psychology and I, and I saw paradigms there that I thought were awfully important for understanding moral functioning. And, and my complaint about Kohlberg's moral stage paradigm isn't just the fact that it was failing on two empirical, uh, two empirical criteria, structured whole and variant sequence. It wasn't just empirical, but I always thought that they were putting up uh, a barrier to engagement with other concepts that we know should be part of our moral framework. And that is the language of virtues and traits and character. You know, that, that, has all, that, that language has been with us also since antiquity. And it didn't seem mm -hmm. quite right that we shouldn't be investigating that empirically just because the Kohlberg team thought that that might give aid and comfort to relativism. So I thought legitimate lines of inquiry were being closed off uh, by not investigating language, virtues, selfhood, personality, those kinds of concepts. And then the Kohlberg team, that paradigm had a problem. The problem was it became very difficult to show that the way one reasons about a moral issue actually leads to moral behavior, moral action. Uh, what does so that there mean? Was, well, it means, it, it means that, um, that, that just because you can reason at a certain moral level doesn't mean that you're gonna translate your understanding into behavior. So it's so like this, you could say this is wrong and then you could go ahead and, and, and do it anyway. Yes. Yeah. You know, so this became known as the judgment action gap. You know, it, mm -hmm. the way I would put it is knowing the right thing to do and then doing it are very different things, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a judgment action gap. And and so one way, so there was a lot of energy around this, you know, the correlation between moral judgment and moral action was it's not nothing. I mean, it, it, there is a modest correlation, but it's not very high. It's like 0.2. Mm -hmm. 0.25, you know, something there, but not as much as you might think. So, right. um, and so there's a lot of energy around how to bridge the judgment action gap. And, and this is where I became very much interested in moral personality. A uh, colleague, uh, Augusto Blasi, who's now retired, he lives in Rome now. But Gus Blasi wrote some very important papers that I found deeply meaningful to me. And that is, he began to write about moral self identity, moral self with moral identity. And what his basic argument was is that we're more likely 
to translate our moral judgment into moral action to the extent that we identify with morality as an aspect of the self. You know, if we can, if our self-understanding is constructed around moral notions, we're more likely to be consistent in our moral judgment and action because not to follow through with the behaviors, the risk giving up your sense of selfhood and we are motivated to maintain our sense of selfhood. So that, that sparked a huge, I mean, this is going on now for at least 20, 15, 20 years now, research in the whole topic of moral identity. And from where I sit, moral self-identity is probably the most interesting a construct now on that we're now wrestling with and what that means. It's probably the mm -hmm. best predictor of moral behavior. I, I see the moral right. Behavior. Okay. I want to return to the moral self identity issue, but I also want to ask you about uh, Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations theory, which I've heard a lot about yeah. in recent years. So that breaks down um, moral values into five dimensions, care, yeah. fairness, authority, uh, purity, and loyalty. loyalty. Yeah. Thank you. So is that, is that um, a leading theory in the field now, or is it, is it more of a, a niche thing? Well, it's, it's uh, well known in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, it is controversial in the field. Uh, I, I don't have any, I, I have, I, in, in some ways, a very interesting theory. Uh, and I would say um, it draws our attention to uh, early life and what we are prepared to believe and do as infants and children. So it draws our attention to evolutionary considerations, cultural considerations. Uh, so there are these five um, uh, foundations he believes. And so I, it's interesting. There are people who just have a very hard time with Jonathan Haidt's theory. So that's all, you know, mm -hmm. the philosophers have trouble with it and some psychologists, but I, I recognize that it is it has its followers as well. And it's a very interesting theory. Uh, it draws our attention to important things. Right, the reason I, I brought it up before, yeah, um, before asking about the self-identity issue is yes. because if, if um, moral concerns are fragmented into various dimensions, then you could imagine people identifying very highly with let's say care, like they, they care a lot about not causing harm to anyone, but right. then they don't identify with other moral concerns that people right. might regard as important. Yeah, I guess Jonathan uh, orients some of these foundations to political conservatives and some to liberals, and mm -hmm. I think he does that. I think that's that's part of the controversial part of this piece. You know, so you frame your question in a very good and interesting way. Uh, so going back to the moral, moral self-identity thing, so, so Gus Blasey would say, has argued, that moral identity is, is, in a way, a way of thinking about personality in a sense that it's a dimension of individual differences. Mm -hmm. So some people have moral notions or construct morality so that morality is central and essential to self-understanding. Other people don't. Uh, some people could prioritize other things like getting ahead or making a lot of money or being famous. You know, and so they would have a different kind of identity, not a moral identity. And even if you have certain kinds of moral identity, you could prioritize different things. So you could, or so some people could have care, a caring orientation is central to their self understanding. Other could be, other people could be justice. You know, so there's a, so there's individual differences in a double sense. You can either be have a moral morality pr uh, prioritized as central to yourself, or some other non-moral value. And even in, in the moral domain, it could be vary among different values. So, right. but, but you talk about moral identity. Let me tell you about a study I love. It's done mm -hmm. by, uh, by Jesse Graham and Carl Aquino and some others. Uh, now, Carl Aquino has done a lot of writing on moral identity. He's a trend. I, I think he does really terrific work. He uh, and, and, this, and this, this study looked at moral foundations theory, what they call the, what's so called binding foundations. So, you, if you take Jonathan Haidt's five, moral foundations, you can group them into two categories. One category is called, are called the binding foundations. This would be loyalty, authority, purity. So loyalty, betrayal, authority, subversion, purity, degradation. Those, that's the binding foundations because these are the things that bind one to one's community, right? And they put, they kind of put a break on the excesses of individualism, these binding foundations. And then the other two foundations of the care and the fairness orientations, they call the individualizing foundations. So, so if you take the five foundations, you group them into two categories, the binding and the 
in the individualizing foundations. Let's take a look just at the binding foundations. Now, uh, our binding foundations are awfully important because they help determine the boundaries of our community and, and help prevent the excesses of individualism. On the other hand, they can have a dark side. Uh, the dark side of the binding foundations that it could lead to the derogation of outgroups, okay? Or the torture of outgroups. Uh, to justify, you know, we we can say, well, we need to, we need to raise our boundaries. We need we need to prevent Muslims from flying to America. You know, we we could put up barriers. You know, that's that's the dark side of the binding foundations. Mm -hmm. So in this study, what they showed is that in a, in a couple of clever experiments that they did, they showed that people who have who score very highly on measures of binding foundations and the moral foundation team have ways of measuring that. People who score very highly on indicators of binding foundations, in fact, are unlikely to come to the aid of people on the other side, people who are on the out groups, and maybe even justify torture, certainly derogating out groups, but that's moderated by moral identity. So, so people mm -hmm. who have a strong sense of moral identity are less likely to do that. Uh, so moral identity turns, ten, turns out to be a pretty robust moderator Mm -hmm. of the dark side of the binding, binding foundations, which again illustrates for me at least um, really the, the, the importance and power of moral self-identity as a, as a construct. Mm -hmm. So with moral self-identity, it it's still seems that what exactly you're identifying with can dr dramatically uh, change your, your perspective on things. So for example, someone who, well, two people who hold their their moral values as equally important, but one person is like all about justice and they're like, so so maybe they would justify torture in the sense of um, it, if it's to if it's to get information that will save lives in the in the event of a terrorist attack or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then someone else who has more of a Kantian ideal of torture is never okay, no matter what. Um, what do you do about that if they have the same type of moral self-identity? Yeah, so the issue is, how do, how do you go how, how do you get along and go along when people's identity are so deeply rooted to one moral conviction mm -hmm. versus another right so how do you get along uh, yeah so that's uh, that's a that's an interesting and hard question you know because I, I have a think I have a feeling that what's happening uh, in our highly polarized culture that we live in today that people are so, are not that willing to listen to the other side uh, because they're uh, assured of the moral correctness of their point of view. So it, so it hardens into a rigid ideology so that we can't reach across the aisle. So everything becomes a highly principled matter such that you can't give up on your principle to shake hands with the Democrats or the Republicans or the Muslims or the Catholics, you know, so everything becomes very rigid. So what do you do about that? Well, uh, so I don't think you can talk about, um, I, I think in addition to moral identity and morality as being central to your self-identity, I think part of that, we have to cultivate other kinds of, uh, other kinds of virtues. I, I think, uh, so my, in my own lab here at Notre Dame and some others around the country, I've gotten very much interested in other kinds of virtues that seem to be necessary to make progress. Uh, to, to live in a less polarized political culture, to make conversation across the moral divide easier, across the political divide. And, and the virtues that I think are increasingly important is are, are intellectual virtues, you know, especially, uh, so I, I think we need to cultivate uh, intellectual humility, uh, open-mindedness, curiosity. I mean, so these, we, we want, here's the problem, Adam. I think so much of a, so much of our lives are spent within echo chambers uh, or epistemic bubbles, and we don't really. And, and so the only moral arguments we ever hear are those that are congenial to our point of view. Do you say and that I, now, due to the rise of, of social media, or yeah, do you I think do this that. has always been the case? Well, I think social media has made things worse, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely worse. And I'm not. I think it's worse now because of social media. Let's just be honest. You know we. You know, you, you know, our Facebooks, our Twitter, Facebook groups of Twitter and Instagram. And uh, we never have to encounter a contrary view ever mm -hmm. in the way we peruse the news of the world, you know, and um, 
yeah, so I think there are just people who casually, you know, um, there, so one author called them hobbits. You know, they're they're in informational hobbits. They just they just happen to hang out with people who have the same views they have, almost accidentally. You know, they they run into self-reinforcing points of view, and then there are then there are individuals who actually have contempt for the other side, uh, and so they they live in uh, uh, they live in an echo chamber where they actually despise the other side. Uh, and I think because the views of the other side um, are so threatening to one's own self-conception, you just can't conceive of being friends with someone or having a member of your family who believes in that point of view. So yeah, I think social media has made it worse. And so I, uh, my colleague, Dom Challoner and I have a paper out in the current, no, I guess not the current issue, the most uh, a recent issue of Educational Psychologist where we make the case that cultivating intellectual virtues, uh, especially humility, I want to say, uh, is probably the way that we're going to be able to yield to better arguments. And I think that's the disposition that is most needed today in our highly polarized media environment that we all live in, uh, is, is a willingness to be curious about the views of the other side, a willingness to yield to better evidence. And I, I don't see a lot of that. And, I, and I'll, I'll be honest, Adam, I think you put your finger on it, really. The, the, so, so moral identity might have a dark side, too, you know, to the extent that we build our identity around certain kinds of moral positions might, might harden into ideology and rigidity and make it much less willing uh, to, engage, to engage others in, in dialogue about an issue. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you're saying about intellectual humility, it seems like to value that as a virtue, it's implicit is submitting to some higher virtue, maybe maybe truth or high. So, if if you value something like admitting, no, being able to admit when you're wrong, um, in order, well, the the only reason you do that, as far as I can tell, is so you can possess the truth. Uh, well, you want to, yeah, so we want to present, I guess, I guess so. I guess there's, I guess we want to, we, I guess we want to have well-attested views. You know, we want our views to be, to, to survive critical analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I, and I guess we want to say true things. Uh, I have to say, personally, I became a big champion of intellectual humility in the process of writing that paper for educational psychologists. Then I, um, I have to say that, uh, it went through like three revisions, and and my co my colleague and I, Dom Dom Challoner and I, had a certain vision about how we wanted to present that. We've been doing work here at Notre Dame, and we thought we would just present that. And it wasn't quite what the special issue required, which was this focus on social media. And so there was a lot of vigorous pushback from three reviewers. And I have to say, the first round of reviews were overwhelming. You know, it's like really a lot here. I don't know whether it required me to go back and read literatures and you know, read a lot of stuff and pull things together. And so I, I felt that the, the paper that we published is really first rate, but if it wasn't for the reviewers, I don't know. I, I, and moreover, we had our, our end just to say, well, they're right. You know, that what the way they're presenting the argument is better than ours. And so we had to accommodate to that and made for a much better paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so to me, that was intellectual. Uh, that was my first brush with intellectual humility and having to and having to um, uh, and having to submit to it or use it, you know, and because it made mm. a much better paper. And what were the findings of this paper? As it, it was a conceptual paper. It was uh, like all papers published in Educational Psychologists. They're more conceptual and in integrative. And so we we're making uh, uh, we're, we're trying to make the case that we're more likely to have um, uh, polarized media. Um, intellectual hobbits and, and, uh, and people unwilling to reach the other side uh, because of a lack of intellectual humility or intellectual virtues generally. And but what we had to do is you, you began our conversation talking about philosophy. Uh, what we had to do is to understand that intellectual humility, intellectual virtues more generally comes out of a philosophical tradition. You know, so the, the, the way things work now, you have 
uh, you have a field called virtue epistemology where philosophers are writing about intellectual virtues and where they come from in Aristotle's theory. And there are different camps there. You have a responsibilist camp and a, um, and a reliableist camp. You have, so you have two camps within virtue epistemology. They're both, both philosophical positions. I'm not a philosopher, you know, so, but we have to wade into those literatures to make sense of what they mean. And then over here, you have educational psychologists who talk about epistemic cognition and, and how children and adolescents reason about knowledge uh, and truth. And then you have educators, you know, and educators, uh, educators and educational psychologists talk together a lot, you know, uh, but hardly anyone talks to the virtue of epistemologists, you know, and so there's, there's a space in between, you know, between the educational psychologists who write about epistemic cognition and virtual epistemologists who write about intellectual virtues, there's a space there for which there's almost no dialogue. And then there's the educators, science educators, for example, who talk to the psychologists, but not to the philosophers. You know, so there's a very interesting interdisciplinary space that I think can be occupied if we had more dialogue across that mending wall. There's a mending wall there too. You know, I think we need more conversation there. So the point of our paper was to encourage, uh, we, we want, wanted to make case, why should educational psychologists care about what the virtual epistemologists have to say. Well, it's because they do the best writing on it. It's whether to understand how do they understand the field. And then science educators have to understand both traditions. You know, so that, so the point of our argument is to make a case for uh, for that interdisciplinary dialogue. And I'll just say one one other thing. There are sometimes there are concepts on the philosophical side of the field, philosophical side of the mending wall, that don't make sense on the empirical side. And so we also took that up in our paper. So uh, maybe, maybe not necessarily in this paper, but I, in some other writings I've done since, we're, we're trying to make sense of some philosophical notions that I don't think are necessary or are better understood using or psychological paradigms. And I'll give you one example. One example is phrenesis. Uh, phrenesis is practical wisdom. You know, and so you, there's a lot of writings on, phren phren on phrenesis and how important that is in the exercise of the virtues. Uh, the philosophers are all over that. Uh, there are some psychologists who love that language of phrenesis, and so they want to pull phrenesis in. I personally don't think phrenesis makes sense as a psychological variable. I think it makes better sense in terms, I think we understand what the philosophers want us to know about phrenesis in terms of metacognition. Uh, there's the whole, the, whole, the whole field of metacognition, I think, accounts for what phrenesis is supposed to do in our intellectual or, or virtuous life. So yeah, so that, so that goes on in that paper too. So there's a lot of space for interdisciplinary dialogue, um, which, which again shows that philosophers and psychologists have to talk to one another. Uh, there, is a, there is a mending wall that we have to cooperate on and we're not always going to agree on what concepts make sense. As I put it in a recent paper, phrenesis makes perfect sense for the virtue of epistemology. They should keep using that term because it helps them understand Aristotle's theory. So I'm not saying stop using the word phrenesis, that's awfully important. It provides us a whole gamut of things to think about on the psychological side. I just don't think, so, so phrenesis you know, does heavy lifting on the virtue epistemology side. I, I don't know whether it's all that helpful on the psychological side. Uh -huh. So what do you think the role of intellectual humility is in academia? Because on one hand, <laughs> you, have, you have every single finding that you have to produce is grounded on the basis of falsification and you have things like peer review. But on the other hand, we even talked about it in terms of when we were going over the history of, the, of moral psychology and everyone seems to naturally just group into these camps and then stop listening to each other. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm smiling when you say that because ac academics, uh, are very good at self-asserting their points of view, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're not willing to accept uh, falsification, you know, and I'm not sure they're wrong to do so either. You know, I, I'm rather Lakatosian. Imre Lakatosh is a famous uh, philosopher of science uh, at the London School of Economics for many years before he died too young, but I, I'm rather Lakatosian in how I think science works. And uh, so I, I, I don't think, uh, it's necessarily the case that scientists have to give up their theories when they bump up against the falsification. I don't think no one really does that. I think what we do instead is find ways of repairing the theory. And um, so, for example, take the Kohlberg team, you know, they, they had a theory and they stuck with it. You know, it bumped up against falsification. They kept repairing it. 
Nothing particularly wrong in that. Lakatos used to say that all theories are born refuted and die refuted. You know, we, you, you know, all, all, all research, all research paradigms have to proceed in an ocean of anomalies. So there's always something wrong with the theory, right? Um, but, but Karl Popper was uh, too radical, really, to think that. You know, you have to give up your theory given a, given a falsification. No, the, the, the history of science refutes that view. No one ever does. And, and Lakatos argued this, it's, it's rational to hold on to your theory so long as you, uh, your repairs to the theory lead to new facts. If it anticipates new facts, some of which are corroborated, you can, you know, keep going in the face of anomaly. You know, uh, the problem with Kohlberg's theory was it was patching up the theory but it wasn't anticipating new facts. In fact, it kept, it kept getting narrower and narrower what it was trying to do. And I, I just think it failed. It became what the Lakatosians would call a degenerating research program over time. And so that's when we jump ship and look for alternative theory. I see. Um, okay, the last thing I wanna ask you about, and this is a pretty big topic, uh, um, is the nature versus nurture debate with, with regards to moral development. Yeah. So in other words, how much of this is is I, I guess nature wouldn't necessarily be like there's moral values grounded in our biology. By that I, I mean more like how much of this is grounded in evolution, and then nurture would obviously be how much of this is based uh, on your on your culture and your upbringing. Yeah, so that's a that's a big question indeed. But I, I think I can cut to the chase here. For for one thing, I, I caution my own students here not to be caught up too much in the nature nurture debate. I don't think, uh, mm -hmm. I think at least from a developmental science perspective, it's, it's uh, they're deeply integrated, nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, every conversation I've ever had about this, wh whatever the topic is, is always both. But the interesting yeah. part, I think, is to what degree does, does each contribute? Yeah, so here, here's the, some findings that I think are really interesting. You know, back in, 90, I want to say 91, Robert M.D., yeah, I think he was at Colorado at the time. He's retired now, but some colleagues, they wrote a paper called The Moral Self of Infancy. And I read that paper in the 90s. And I thought, wow, this is wild. I don't really get this. But I would say over time, I thought it was brilliant. I think it's one of the most important papers I've read in almost my lifetime. What he basically argued is that infants come prepared with five biological motives. He called them biological motives. I'm not sure that's the best word. But so five biological tendencies uh, I guess by evolution, and they 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 allow the child to that provides the biological foundation for the kinds of nurturance that leads into the development of the moral self. You know, so and so I found that interesting because children are born, infants are born prepared to engage the world, engage their caregivers, they signal the caregivers, there's reciprocity, they're, they're motivated to form relationships, uh, and these five biological motives. Uh, lay the groundwork for, for, later moral, uh, for later moral formation. So there's been a lot of energy now. If you, you ask me, wh where is moral psychology at today? What's the, most, what's the hottest topic? I would say identifying the moral dispositions and capacities of infants and young really? children. And so there's a lot of energy. So for example, there's this, there's this whole paradigm sometimes called the new nativism where they're, where they're uh, examining what seems like reasoning abilities in six month old infants and 10 month old infants. And some of it is direct towards moral questions. So for example, there are, there are, there's, there's research that tends to show that, that young infants in the first year of life prefer people who are fair. You know, they dislike people who are unfair. They seem to have a justice motive. They seem to prefer fairness. And you know, so it's just amazing stuff. Um, that, uh, so, so early moral capacities might be an early achievement uh, that comes in the first year of life. And I don't know whether it's best to describe this as nature versus nurture, other than to say children come prepared to be, to be moral selves because of what they bring with them at birth. And of course, this, this will have to be elaborated on in the context of a nurturing, socializing environment. You know, so that's the nurture piece of that. Uh, but so I think that's where the energy is these days. And mm -hmm. yeah, I've been playing around this with this idea. You can tell me what you think about it. That um, that morality is basically always going to emerge from any sort of value system. So in other words, even if you claim to be amoral, if you're acting and prioritizing something over another, then automatically you're acting out an implicit value system. 
Yeah, there's so, certainly that. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. I think there's an implicit value system. Right. Uh, so then there's, it seems like that for sure would, would be present even in infants. But then I'm wondering how much of it is, is morality in the sense that we've been talking about it through this conversation. And then how much of it is more like that, that kind of weak morality that just has to do with prioritizing some some decisions or some events over others for your own well, for your own benefit. Yeah, I, so I, I obviously, I guess infants make choices, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't. And I guess we can call that a value system if you'd like. One, one of the lines of research that I have great respect for uh, looks at the development of a, of, a, of moral conscience, as she calls it, conscience in mm -hmm. infancy, uh, being able to abide by adult rules without supervision. Basically, is what she's calling conscience development. It's early emerging. Thing, certainly by age three and um, and basically the idea is that kids will uh, gravitate towards moral towards to parents injunctions and their rules and their boundaries because they basically love their parents they want to have relationships with them um, and then they come to uh, identify these injunctions with their own self so the moral self probably emerges within the first couple of years of life uh, on the basis of the first relationship that they have with their parents. And parents can nurture them in different directions depending on the child's temperament. You know, so having, a, uh, so having goodness of fit between the dispositions of the child and the parenting style, like the, way, the way parents engage that child uh, will conduce to the development of the moral self. Uh, so, the, so the research paradigm I have in mind is, is uh, Grazina Kahanska at, at, at Iowa. And she's done just amazing, amazing research over a long time, demonstrating how temperament and, and the conditions of child rearing can coalesce into a sense of conscience in early life, and how this conduces to the development of the moral self in, say, preschool age, and how this regulates behavior all throughout childhood. So, uh, yeah, the, I, I'd imagine that there'd be a lot of overlap there with with early childhood aggression because you know two-year-olds are, are the most aggressive uh people there are and then gradually they get socialized in, into uh into either so either controlling that aggression or um manifesting it in in competitiveness yeah so i don't know whether they're, they're the most aggressive at any other time but i but there, I mean, there is in terms of know, frequency not in terms yeah, of I, I, uh, harm <laughs> you know what's going on there is um what's going on there i wouldn't necessarily call it aggression i would just say uh if 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 children are acting out if it's the terrible twos we're talking about they, they seem to be more defiant and um uh, if they seem more aggravated, I think what I understand that whole behavior under a whole other developmental lens, which is individuation, ego development rather than moral development. Uh, so I think kids are just making a gesture towards independence and individuation and autonomy there. So. Right. So that that explains a good amount of of the socialization part. Now, lastly, to to try and tie this back to the to the nature idea, I've I've done some research on evolutionary game theory and i'm sure you've heard of of the the tit for tat thing so even ai in a in a economic trading game where it's something like you can choose to cooperate or discooperate and you you win money let's see it's it's something like if both players cooperate they both get five dollars if right. you cooperate and the your opponent doesn't they get ten dollars and you lose five dollars and then if you both don't cooperate um you both get nothing so in in any given scenario you're incentivized to not cooperate you get more money or you avoid losing money if you choose to not cooperate but over mm -hmm. the long term if you cooperate it ends up being the most efficient strategy um or the and then the four tat part is if your opponent chooses not to cooperate you have to get revenge for a single round uh, so they don't just take advantage of you every single time mm -hmm. and always get the $10. So it seems like that's something that can emerge even in AI. And then we look at that and think, wow, the computer is learning to play fair. But in reality, it seems like it's just acting out the most efficient solution as a sort of natural law. And I'm wondering how much of our cooperation, our pro-sociality evolved for that type of reason just that it 
it's uh, it proved over evolutionary spans of time to be the most efficient solution. And then only later did we sort of look at that and develop these uh, judgments yeah, of fairness. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's something to what you're saying. Uh, I, uh, I remember reading, a, I actually reviewed a book by Dan McAdams at Northwestern uh, he called the, the Art of Personality Development. And he makes the case in his book that, you know, we, we notice personality differences mm -hmm. because they matter to us for our evolutionary adaptiveness and success. You know, we notice people who are free riders, for example. We notice people who are cooperative. Um, and it has some evolutionary significance for us. And that's how we begin to pick out and give names to traits, you know, because they have some evolutionary significance to us. Yeah. So there's something to be said for what you're saying, that, that probably over time we have learned that cooperation matters more for our adaptiveness as a social species, more than individual mm -hmm. competitiveness. And, um, and then maybe over evolutionary time, we begin to pick out these char characteristics and dignify them with important names like justice and fairness and other rich the, uh, philosophical concepts. Right. It seems like our in-group, out-group biases are, are also grounded in the same um, our ev evolutionary past, not to say, not to commit the naturalistic fallacy and say that we should always prioritize in-group over out-group, but just to point at the, um, the reason for that, for, for our polarization. Yeah, I have a hunch that what is considered the the distinguishing characteristics that makes one an in-group and then one makes one the out-group uh, are going to be fungible. They're going to be something that um, are going to dissolve. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know. I think human beings are very quick to form groups. You know, to form us and them. You know, if you're you're a part fan, you're a Yankee fan. You know, you know so we 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 assume right. that there are these differences, and we're very quick to to form a very um, I think there's a robust line of research on this in social psychology too. The minimal group comparison, I think that research is called. Uh, mm -hmm. we, so we're very, we're, we're on very minimal grounds, we form groups, you know, so there's probably some good evolutionary reason for that. I think though, that we can transcend that. I think we as rational people, we can, we can judge when, when the criteria for group making us and them, when it's minimal and insignificant and when it's significant and important. So right. And it seems optimistic our, that yeah. um, that differences between individuals tend to be greater than differences between groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I honestly do believe that there's um, I, that's why I'm all, always wary of people making broad generational claims about Generation X and I generation, you know, because there's more individual differences within within the category than between, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you just said, but that's sort of what I think yeah. I believe that there's more more variability within your group than between your group and another group. Or yeah, exactly. Group. Yeah, so I, I just think we just need to be on the lookout for when when the minimal group criteria is significant, really significant or not. You know, basically, I I think we have to learn to talk to one another in this country. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, that some of the, I know politicians often say there's more that unites us than divides us, but that's hard to see sometimes in the nature of our political discourse. Mm -hmm. Right. So lastly, um, you've, you've talked about moral education. What would your hope be for, for our next generation um, in terms of, you, you mentioned intellectual humility. Is there anything else, either any, yeah. any other ideas or? Yeah, Adam, let me say, and I, I've said this to my students here at Notre Dame too. Mm -hmm. I actually have a lot of confidence mm -hmm. in the young generation now. I guess I'm a boomer, you know, but, uh, but as I look around uh, young people today, people who are adolescents, people who are young adults, I have enormous confidence. And I'm going to say your generation, Adam, mm -hmm. not, <laughs> not, yeah. not to put you in a group or anything, but uh, <laughs> I have enormous confidence in your generation and younger generation. Because as I look around, I see that they're, committed to social justice. I see that they're to more tolerant than the boomers in my generation are. I just, uh, I, I just feel like um, they're, they're more open to respecting differences, less prejudiced, uh, uh, and more open to conversations about, about justice. And we're seeing it around the country now with our conversations about racial justice. Uh, I just think they're going to lead the way. 
Uh, and so I have enormous confidence in that. I, I do think we need to find ways in our educational system to pay attention to the cultivation of important virtues. I don't, I, 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 we're, we're wrestling with, with this now in a couple of research teams I'm with on how to, how to fold a commitment to intellectual virtues in science education. We, our, our, our focus on science education is because we see so many people denying the claims of science and, and science denialism I think is also pretty, it's a pretty unfortunate stance that people are taking now. Right. So, because in, in some ways that's a commitment to truth too, right? I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, you have to have a, it's, so how to understand the role of science in making judgments about our democracy and what's good public policy is, is, is a really crucial for our country moving forward. And, and to the extent that we can lower the polarizing ideological uh, boundaries that seem to call into question scientific claims, it would be the, the number one, to me anyway, my, my number one challenge for education these days. And, and as I look around, I'm less concerned about how they resolve hypothetical moral dilemmas. I'm more concerned that they cultivate a disposition where they're open-minded and curious and willing to submit to the evidence. And those are just basically intellectual virtues. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think that's a great place to stop. So Dan, thank you so much for your time. Welcome, it's a great conversation. Mm-hmm.